We are joined by Benjamin Bush, the president of Mixed Martial Arts Zambia. How are you doing, Ben? I'm very good, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me on your show. Well, I'm looking forward to, to this conversation. Let's dive right into it. Let's talk about the recent IMF African Championship. Uh, obviously, T- Team Zambia competed there. Uh, what were your, and you were there coaching and cornering your team. Tell us your overall impression of your team's performance. Uh, I was I was very, uh, very satisfied with my team's performance, actually. Uh, we were meant to take more athletes down, but we had issues with uh, bureaucracy and uh, government offices here in Zambia that meant that uh, three athletes didn't get their passports. So I, I genuinely believe that had they had we had the full team, morale would have been uh, would, have, would have been given a boost and uh, a couple of those guys would have meddled as well. So. I would have been expecting five five medals and the two that uh, well the, and and Ken probably um, you know receiving that morale boost to uh, and having the, the correct team behind him probably uh, he would have he would have got, got the gold but that was a great finale so you know uh, in all we had three athletes compete uh, we had uh, Mwawe and Carter who is was a one and zero athlete. Um, you know, and uh, he he actually uh, got his win back in October after only four months of training uh, against uh, a guy who had been training, you know, for quite some time, who was also zero and zero going into that fight. Um, so when he entered this the quarterfinals, he took on the top seeded South African. I believe he was the top seeded. He had sixteen fights in total, so he was very very experienced, a complete gent as well. Like uh, all the all the fighters were just you know, you know we, everybody we met there it was such a great atmosphere. But um, yeah, well, I managed to go the distance, you know, and uh, you know, and we saw after watching, you know, uh, his fight back, you know, that he, you know he could have won that fight, you know, had had we implemented the game plan because you know I think nerves are nerves were in play there as well, you know. Um, but it was a great fight against a great opponent who we, we really wish the best for and hope he has he turns pro and has a fantastic career. Um, there were there were two other fights obviously two other fighters, sorry. Um, Kelvin Shishimba. Kelvin is a is is an absolute like beast um, you know uh, in competition and in uh, in 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 the gym and uh, you know, I was a bit surprised actually he underperformed, um, but uh, it is what it is, and uh, he he unfortunately uh, didn't get through his um, his quarterfinal, but he'll he'll be back. And then of course we had uh, Ken uh, Miando Sekaletu. Now Ken is Ken is someone. All three of these athletes actually, um, Kelvin and Ken, uh, they came through my social project, so they were with me for about. Three and a half years, um, wow. three to four, three to four years before COVID hit. You know, we couldn't get them any fights, and that's partly uh, will probably lead on to the conversations that we're going to have. You know, about the association because uh, I effectively set up the association to try and give these guys opportunities. Um, and um, yeah, so I couldn't get them fights. COVID came along, and they ended up um, at uh, at another gym because the other gym opened quicker. Um, so. Ken is just, you know, he's a phenom. Actually, he really is. He's a he's the GFC um, featherweight champion, but he competed with us at lightweight. That's his natural weight. And um, yeah, you know, uh, he he did what he needed to do. Um, he got into an incredible final against um, uh, Luis Matea. Luis Matea being the Zimbabwean, and uh, I'll tell you something like. Uh, Zimbabwe didn't have a corner, so um, you know I uh, I offered to help corner. So I cornered Lewis for his first two fights up until um, you know into his semi final, uh, semi no, his sorry semi final, yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, and it was clear, you know, Lewis is highly intelligent, an IQ fighter with huge power and you know technique everywhere, you know. And I knew that, the, that, that he would face Ken in the final, and I knew it would be the, you know, in terms of MMA, and uh, you know, that was the fight of the tournament. I mean, I obviously I'm, but I really believe that if you watch that fight, 
that fight shows two athletes who are so strong in all at, in all areas and all aspects, and they're trying to work out, you know, how to counter one another. I mean, there was a couple of times where, uh, well, Lewis went and and managed to get a great. Um, he he did a Granby roll to get out of a back take, and uh, he managed to use that to turn the tables on Ken and you know get a dominant position. And I believe in the, the second round again, he he tried the same technique because Ken is very very good at uh, at wrestling. Uh, Ken was taking his back, and he tried the Granby roll, and Ken had already made the adjustments, understood the Granby roll and counted it mid roll. And, you know, so it's just things like this. I mean, uh, those guys have huge futures. And what I really hope for them both is that they, they stay amateur and that they go to the worlds and um, that they end up in the finals at the worlds. Cause um, that, that's, that for me is like the best avenue for, for athletes because, you know, uh, I'm I'm probably digressing. You're probably gonna probably be asking these questions already, but yeah, uh, no, th- 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 this is great. Actually, I was I was just going to say, uh, you know, for anyone who's interested in catching the action, you can watch it on on IMAF Live. You can you know check out the the entire tournament. But I I wanted to ask you th- th- this is this is very interesting because you were obviously there cornering not just your team but L- L- Lewis uh, from from Zimbabwe as well. Um, what were your overall impressions of the level of uh, of talent and potential at this tournament and and in Africa as far as amateur MMA? What what, what can you tell us about the the talent there? Um, I I mean I just I just it was such an incredible experience. Um, the level of talent is is high. You know um, you know. Uh, we, you know, Africa is new to this, um, but there are there were several people in all categories who would do well at the world. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think that you know, um, you know, a couple more years and and the Africa Championships, everybody will be watching that. Like, okay, right, these are the top contenders. These are the top seed contenders. You know, um, you know, South Africa and Angola just have such a wealth of talent. You know, they they. Um, they they train with science behind them, you know. Right. And in, in Angola, you know, you've got this great camaraderie. The team is like a, is, is something in itself, you know. And it's uh, all with sportsmanship, you know. It really is uh, special, and they really have a great um, uh, federation and association. South Africa, standing Namibia as well. Namibia came to the table, you know. Uh, Mauritius, like us, are new to the game, you know. They did well. Uh, uh, Congo, you know, it, I, I I really think that um, the Africa Championships um, is going to be the place, you know, like, uh, you know. Wow. I mean, and, and the federations that are joining the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation, it is, it is 100%. You know, um, I just want to say this to anybody out there who um, is, is trying to set up an association and is considering... Uh, other governing bodies, uh, as a you know, as opposed to IMAF, um, and a lot of the, uh, the, diff- the the criticism to some degree is because oh you know it's difficult to to get uh, affiliated to IMAF. Yes, the reason it is is because it is the premier the premier um, governing body, and it has in place all the checkbox that you need to be absolutely a hundred percent legitimate, transparent, uh, democratic safe you know and that takes work and time and you know i'll say to anybody in any of the the countries that do not have governing bodies or governing associations contact imaf you know it is the way forward it is the way forward because they care they care about the grassroots they care about growing the grassroots they care about giving back to the community and they're not just there just to exploit you know and um you know i i urge i urge all um all the countries in africa let's do this together because what we found in zambia is that um mma sa have been running for a long time as the south african governing body and they provided us with such a wealth of information i mean the information sharing and and the and you know the governance that you know the you know the, the regulation side of it you know the 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 uh yeah, even even the 
interactions with government, etc. You know, they they've been there, they've done it, and they 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 provide it with just a open arms policy. I mean, um, no, it, it's it's a revelation. And I've been in I've been in sports a while, and I've never met uh, you know a governing body or a group of federations who are so um, open to aiding you know what is effectively going to be a competitor. <laughs> right. Very interesting. We're, we're going to get into that. But I wanted to ask you, Team Zambia was awarded the best national federation for 2021. Tell us yeah. what this award means for MMA sports development in Zambia and for you and the team. Congratulations, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, for us, it's, it was it was a huge deal. Um, it, a lot of sweats and you know and uh, and hard work went into um, getting the association up and running. And um, you know, and we've done a huge amount of work um, to incorporate you know positive social change. Those are buzzwords, but you know, real real um, grassroots community action work into the growth strategy of the association. And um, last year we had a symposium and uh, Chris Cyborg um, came out to Zambia and, you know, that was huge. And we used that opportunity to launch our Women's Commission, um, which is going to be, uh, you know, going into um, top gear th this year, you know, and, and that is, um, you know, for, you know, gender balance, uh, you know, uh, gender-based violence awareness, you know, just, just there's so many aspects that uh, a women's commission can bring to an association. You know, it's a very important factor that we we we, we brought in, and it it was it's big for us because it's also like uh, IMAF have recognised the hard work we've done, but they've also given us something that we can now go to our, our government and we can say, hey, you know, we are real. We are not just another association here to sit back and rake in. Uh, you know, membership fees, you know, no, we're not. We, in fact, we've waived all membership fees, but, you know, we are here, we're here because we care, you know, and uh, this is the proof. And that goes, a, that goes a long way, you know, it does go a long way. So no, for, from all of us, we're, we're honored. Very interesting. And uh, how did you guys manage to, to reach out to, to Cyborg and, and, and to bring over? Because I, I think it's, it's really important, as you mentioned, you know, involving women in development of, of, of combat sports. And it's it's great to see that you guys are, are you and Zambia are taking that leadership because, of course, we're seeing uh, on the professional side, you know, huge growth in, in, in women's mixed martial arts, which I think yeah. is only beneficial uh, for the entire community, for the participation of women in sports. Can you elaborate and, and tell us a little bit about uh, Chris Cyborg, for those who may not be familiar with this MMA legend. Yeah, so Chris Cyborg is just an incredible, uh, you know, mixed martial arts athlete. She's the, um, she, she holds titles in uh, Invicta, Bellator, UFC, um, and Strikeforce. You know, I, I think she, she's the only, she's the only athlete to hold um, four titles in four promotions. Uh, you know, it, she's she's um, devastating. She's been the top of top of the women's division for a very long time. She lost to Amanda Nunes, but you know, if, if she was to rematch Amanda Nunes, um, it would be extremely competitive. You know, um, we we actually reached out to uh, Juliana Pena as well. I think uh, would would have a huge amount of difficulty with Chris, <laughs> but uh, we reached out to um, a lot of uh, of high level athletes. Uh, I personally did, you know, contacted their management, you know, uh, women, uh, female athletes, uh, you know, because I want, I wanted a um, strong female role model to, to, uh, you know, to you, to, to, to ensure that this, that people understood what I wanted to get out of the sport. You know, I, I want the sport to be used to, um, create role models who become changes for their communities. And, you know, um, it just made a lot of sense. And Chris Cyborg's team reached out straight back to us. You know, no one else got back to us. You know how you oh. get a brick, you know, pretty much a nobody reaching out to people through, my, you know, through lots of different avenues. Uh, you know, and 
they, they reached out straight away and they were like, yeah, we're definitely interested. We'd love to, you know, we, we, we want to help. We want to do stuff in Africa. We, in fact, Chris has a relationship with Cyborg. She, she, uh, trained, she did a few fight camps in, uh, with Richie Kwan's in, um, uh, in South Africa. Um, and she's done work, I believe in Ghana, you know, just charitable work. So she was, she was more than excited to do it. And, um, and it snowballed from there. And, you know, um, we had, we had a visit, um, a uh, safe house for, for young girls, uh, you know, an orphanage, um, you know, yeah, even some other things like an elephant sanctuary, et cetera. But then this, this symposium, you know, she gave a talk and her talk was incredible. You know, she, she gave her whole history from shoot box all the way through to, uh, and you can find that on our Facebook page. It's not, it's not got the best audio quality, but the content is just incredible. I just wish we'd nailed the audio quality because um, that interview in itself is, <clears throat> is a very um, impressive interview. Outstanding. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to go back and, and check that out. Now, it's interesting because earlier on in the conversation, you talked about uh, social development in, in initiatives in the country. And, and, and again, I think it's really cool um, that, that you guys are doing that. I read an article about this youth development initiatives uh, that, that you're part of, that, that you started, actually, I believe. Tell us about this program, why you started it, and its relationship to the development of, uh, of MMA. Okay, so initially I started uh, the program because I started my gym and my, my gym was, and I had a lot of people coming who just, they couldn't afford to pay. So I was like, well, let me just have paying members who can cover the costs of those who can't pay. So I started running it like that. And then effectively, then I started looking for donations. Hey, how, how can I help these, these guys go from A to B or how can I get them equipment so that we can, you know, we can operate. By the time we got the association up and running, I, I developed a, uh, a, a, a blueprint for a, for a um, youth development program and a sports development program. So that's really where it is. I mean, it hasn't been rolled out um, effectively yet, but it will be. You know, this is going to be the year. This will be a game changing year. And I actually think that uh, um, sports governing bodies around the world will will take notice as to what MMA Zambia does in the next couple of years. I, I think it's that pioneering. So, you know, effectively what we're trying to do is we use the uh, certification programs of International Mixed Martial Arts Federation and the career progression pathways of um, International Mixed Martial Arts Federation. But we combine them in such a way that um, as athletes progress and as athletes move on to becoming to get coaching certificates and other training certifications, and are encouraged to take on other skill sets such as um, social media marketing, et cetera, you know, so that, uh, you know, or small business, uh, small business skills, et cetera. Uh, and they open their own gyms. Then they, they undertake a course uh, where they, they learn our vulnerable youth program, which tackles mental health, HIV and AIDS, drug and alcohol abuse, et cetera. It uses the sport as a metaphor for each of these, 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 12, these 12 kind of uh, lessons, uh, so to speak. You know, it includes things such as, you know, self-belief, you know, so you, you actually have kids, you know, we... we okay, I'm divert... <laughs> no, no, this is, this is great. Please continue. No, this is great. Yeah, so, so it uses things like... Uh, like the same visualization techniques that I'd have my athletes uh, go through prior to stepping into the cage so that they, you know, are in control of their nerves. And, you know, um, these visualization techniques, I, I, I show the, 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 the kids in the vulnerable youth program. And then I say to them, look, now I want you to visualize yourself walking down the streets of New York, but you're in a suit and you're going to a high rise, but you own the high rise, you know. These are kids who who are you know on the streets you know uh, hustling you know and right. you know have no food at the end of the day and are dressed in rags you know and you know those type of um, techniques to have kids see themselves in in situations that they never believed they would be able to attain can help them get there so. So this is a like a vulnerable youth program. It's a twelve step program. It uses a lot of psychology, sports psychology, but it always refers to MMA. You know, um, for instance, there's even a 
it's even a lesson on fake news uh, the, wow. and, and how it is we 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 talk about uh i mean fake news is a big issue in in for instance here in zambia you know uh, whatsapp will come in and someone someone will share it a thousand times and it's something really graphic and, and horrible but it's fake you know right um so it can be used you know for politics etc so we use this uh, um this uh the idea of selling uh, a fake technique so you know um jab inside low kick for example and then we show the jab fake the inside low kick spinning back fist and then we're like well we manipulated you we sold you something that wasn't true so we could take advantage of you and this is what is happening you know so we kind of interrelate through the sport to lots of different topics so back to the the kind of sports development side of it is when an athlete gets his coaching certificate and wants to open his gym um you know once he's he's graded to a certain level he gets his coaching certificate he wants to open his gym then uh they can come to us and we can subsidize uh the idea is that we will be able to subsidize things like equipment etc uh, provided they 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 provide the vulnerable youth program to the community uh you know once a week or twice a week or something and obviously it's only helpful to them because they get to identify talent they're helping the community the community is you know proud of what they're doing they can lean on sponsors to to help them with you know with uh with scsr the corporate social responsibility side of things and you know and it snowballs from there so we're really trying to um create a a network you know that that can that can rise up and grow and that can be self-sufficient and that you know ath athletes do not have to just fall back on being competitors you know they will be able to um, be able to set up gyms that are actual functional gyms that are also creating future champions but you know that give back to the community this is really interesting stuff because uh, a lot of the times we, we tend to, uh, as, as sports fans, only look at sports as, as a competitive sport and not look at the whole, you know, the, the sport holistically in terms of what it provides an individual, as you mentioned, self-confidence, and as well as a community, right? Of bringing the community up, being a support mechanism. I'm, I mean, you hear a lot of athletes in competitive sports say that for them, sport was, was, uh, was family for them right it was it was an upbringing and of course you know you you know there's a psychology aspect there's the skills development aspect and it's just really incredible to to hear that and i think as you mentioned earlier on this could be a model for for sports development uh, as far as mma goes uh you know maybe in other countries in africa and elsewhere in the world i'm curious to know what's your combat uh, combat sports story uh, and how did you get involved in MMA and MMA in Zambia? Okay, so I was born in Zambia. Um, and like everybody in Zambia, we were wild on uh, ninja films. And Kung nice. Kung. <laughs> we used to consume a lot of these, you know, we used to walk for, for miles to go to the rental shop and get a VHS and walk miles back. And it had what was written on the side in the tape when you put it in and, you know, and you'd be watching like, you know, uh, Revenge of the Ninja or Ninja 3 or Drunken Master or, you know, Snake in the Eagle Shadow. And so I was always like a huge fan of uh, of Kung Fu, really. And I ended up doing karate here. And then I ended then I went to the UK and I stopped doing uh, martial arts for quite some time. And uh, I was a bit of a wayward teen. So I got, you know, I, I, I uh, went I almost went the wrong way. Uh, you know, I could have ended up, um, you know, um, possibly, uh, you know, spending time in prison and, you know, things like that. I really wasn't with the focus or direction that I needed. And it wasn't until after um, I came back to London and I started um, training at Pancrase London, which was Jess Lialden's gym um, back in 2003, I think is when I started. Uh, actually training um, that I that I I found what I felt was you know a family and it gave me focus it gave me direction you know um, I was never I was, I was never a competitor but um, but I found what I wanted 
you know, I found what I needed and, and it put me, it put me straight. And, um, then, uh, interestingly, um, so that gym was actually very successful. Jess Lialdin fought in the UFC, I think five times. Uh, we had, we had a number of fantastic, uh, teammates who have gone on to great things. Uh, you know, uh, Ashley Grimshaw is now with Brad Pickett, a GB top team. Uh, Brad Pickett was with us when he initially was uh, getting into the sport when he was at Cage Rage. Um, just just a number of great athletes, uh, Wendell, um, and you know, some 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 names there on the UK circuit. And we used to go to these competitions, and you'd find you know Michael Bisping, um, Paul Daly, all these guys would be competing on the same cards. You know, and maybe it was in the Circus Tavern in in. Uh, you know, a strip club in, in Essex or something in a smoky room, you know, where, where, when a, a fighter, uh, the opponent fell out, they, they would say, anybody in here want to fight? And, you know, wow. those would be hands up, even if they had no, no, no experience. So it was a bit like that. I mean, uh, I've got some great stories about Lee Murray and people like that as well. But, um, yeah, um, I, I found, I, I, I cornered a friend of mine, Mark Chen, on, on a fight card. And uh, there was this young Brazilian fighter um, on the card. And he, uh, he devastated his opponent. Like, just absolutely blew him out of the water with incredibly, you know, uh, vicious and technical Muay Thai. And then uh, jumped up on the ropes and did this huge backflip. He's like, who's this guy, man? He's larger than life. And obviously, we're, we're cornering, so we're backstage. And I asked this, this guy that was sitting on the side in flip-flops, it's like, who's the guy that was just fighting? It's like, yeah, it was me. It was Jose Aldo. Wow. He couldn't speak English. Yeah. Wow. At the time, he, he was such, he was, he made such a huge impression because he was so devastating in, in, in competition and then such a sweet and humble human being, you know, in person. And he was like, you know, come down and, and train with us. I think he was, uh, Training with Pedro, not hundred percent sure. It's a long time ago, but um, I started. Nova to... Uniao, I think it is. He's, he's, he's yeah, he's... Nova Uniao. That, yeah, 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 but well, whilst he was in the UK, he was, he was training with Pedro. Yeah, so he was with oh. Nova Uniao. So I started to follow his story, and obviously, like um, this is where this was the litmus paper for. The, well, this was the the spark for the for, for what I did, uh, what I wanted to do, because I found out that he was training out of a social project. Well, he was, he was with Nova Union, but when he first moved to Rio, he ended up sleeping on the floor with Hakran Diaz and Marlon Sandro. And uh, he was staying in a drug controlled favela called Moro de Santa Mara in the South Zone. And Marlon Sandro had set up like a social project just teaching jujitsu. And, uh, you know, and some of these guys had uh, gone on to, you know, um, Eduardo Dantes was a Shuto champion who uh, done well in Shuto in Japan as well as in Brazil. Um, and obviously Jose Aldo had torn it up at, uh, you know, all the local fights and, and then he got signed to the WEC. But they were using, you know, sport and uh, camaraderie and a sense of family to keep kids out of the drug gangs. And they were changing lives. It was, it's under, uh, you know, right now, if you go tomorrow at the Santa Mara, you can, you can go and you can visit that small little social project and they've got like 20 black belts, you know, 20 high level Andre Pedernares black belts, you know, and plenty of MMA fighters there. And, you know, they're all doing great work in the community. So um, that to me was inspirational. So uh, I, I borrow from there. And you see, the thing is, in there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, but to have a governing body that supports you to do good things, is 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 something that's not really there so you know pedro pedro is a old old school ufc guy he runs a a great social project out there near um complexo de mari i think and uh, you know there's just so many i mean he, all, all the guys Thiago santos uh he has a social project in uh, the city of god um and you know I'm, I'm sure Charles Oliveira does his does his fair share as well. I mean, everybody puts back, and what I wanted to do is put in place a um, a culture of giving back, you know, from from the foundations. 
You know, it's it's interesting because uh, I, I <clears throat> on on uh, I'm familiar with you know some of these projects, but in addition to that, th there's a lot of that sort of initiative as well in other combat sports such as judo. You you see a lot of that and, and jujitsu, of course, all over the world, where where they're really doing incredible uh, social development work, uh, and, and so on. So it, 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 again, it goes back to, to the importance of, of, uh, showcasing the value of the sport because it truly is more than a sport on that note. I think the topic of Lee Murray is probably a standalone <laughs> episode because I, and, and it's fascinating because in the two thousands, um, uh, in 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 the UK, I mean, there was a real boom in uh, mixed martial arts, and I think any combat sports fan, uh, especially I think later in 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 the later in the mid to late two thousands, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a lot of noise coming out of of uh, of the UK on on the mixed martial arts side. Of course, boxing is is huge there, and uh, uh, other combat sports, but. <clears throat> Quick question about Lee Murray, because I remember the hype around this guy uh, yeah. at one point, but, but before he went off on his, uh, on his. Uh, Tangent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But, <laughs> but if, like, you know, the hype in terms of, of him as a mixed martial arts, like, like they were really hyping him up. And in your opinion, um, and. And, and I'm surprised there's no documentary, Netflix or some other streaming site documentary on, on this individual, because out of all the, the characters, and obviously I, I don't know this guy personally or anything like that, but hearing stories over the years, it seemed like he's one original character. Tell us about him as, as, an, as a competitor. How good was he at, at, at that time? Because the, the, the hype was really like, he was the next big thing coming out of, uh, UK MMA. I mean, I think, you know, I think the hype was justified, you know, like he was an absolute warrior, you know, like, uh, and, you know, his, his boxing was just on fire. Um, but he could, he, I mean, he took, uh, he took Anderson Silva to a decision, I, I believe, like in cage rage, I'm pretty sure he took Anderson Silva to a decision at the time when Anderson Silva was tearing up pride, you know, um, no, he 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 had all the skills. I mean, you know, um, he was uh, a bona fide and legitimate street fighter. You know, Jorge Masvidal uh, has nothing on him. No, well, maybe Jorge does. Actually. But uh, you know, Lee was uh, from from that side of town. You know, and it, you know, and connected with those type of people that. Um, you know, everyday thing was like a, you know, uh, a straightener, you know. I didn't know him personally, but uh, I interacted with him a couple of times and he was a complete gentleman. And I also saw him interact with like, you know, six bouncers at one time and finish them all, you know, wow. like he, he was a phenomenal street fighter. And he took that discipline into MMA and he, you know, um, I think he was with London Shoot Fighters and, you know, that's a great team and they know how to teach MMA. and you know, he, he was a threat. I mean, his UFC, I believe his debut, he got a triangle choke submission. You know, no one expected him to do that. I think that was against uh, Rivera. I can't remember exactly. But um, no, uh, Lee was legit. And, you know, had he, had he not gone the way he had gone, I think the feeling in the UK was this guy could have easily been a champion in the UFC, you know, and that division, you know, was a stacked division even then. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you're right. He he did beat him via tri uh, triangle armbar. I just Googled, <laughs> you just Googled it uh, yeah. right now. But I uh, know he's, uh, he's, it's, it's fascinating character, but I, I don't want to go off on, on my own tangent yeah. here. I want to go back uh, and, and, uh, and and speak to uh, speak to us about your approach to coaching and developing uh, com competitors. What do you look for in in athletes, and and how do you guide them through their their skills development? Because I, I follow you on social media, you got a lot of interesting content in regards to to some of your athletes and 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 the drills you, you guys were doing in in preparation for for the African Championship. So speak to us on on your coaching methodology. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so. Um... 
Okay, so what do I look for in an athlete? I mean, quite often you'll find that, you know, the, the most athletically gifted athlete is not going to be the, 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 the competitor who gives you what you need as a coach in order for you to make them what they can be, you know? Um, so you're not looking just for athletic. It, it get, um, people get uh, caught up in, you know, oh, this guy's incredible, you know, he's the next future superstar, you know. Um, but I look for a little bit more than that. I look for, you know, now, now I've learned a lot of lessons. And now I look for, um, you know, how they're going to fit in this team that I'm running because my team is, is uh, it's not a big team. I, I don't have a lot of resources and, you know, I'm looking for, for athletes who um, are looking to learn and dedicated and coming to training and, really want to do something with with the sport but also you know um uh want to want to give back to the team a little bit as well i think that's quite important so i i'm not strictly looking for um exceptional um athletes they exist and they come through my gym all the time and there's a lot of phenomenal athletes and i encourage them and i i allow them to train but then maybe they're not going to make the team or Maybe I'm going to encourage them to go to other teams or something, you know, along these lines. Um, I, I use a lot of different techniques, but really what I try and do is I, I learn a lot from what is available to me. You know, I'm not a black belt in jujitsu. You know, I'm not a Muay Thai fighter with a hundred fights. What I am is, um, is uh, a coach, a good coach. You can, sort of put together pieces of the puzzle and uh, and create training methods that means it will sit in your um, subconscious memory and your reflex memory and your muscle memory you know and in order to do that i um, i kind of um put together a story <laughs> so to, you know i don't do this every class but i i tend to i tend to lean towards using this style of teaching where uh, I will teach a technique that flows into another technique. If it's a technique day, I'll teach a technique that flows into another technique. So maybe it's a striking technique. Maybe it's a few combinations. Um, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll focus on one. That will lead into a takedown, maybe a couple of takedowns. Then it will focus on one. And then it will uh, lead into some sort of control and either a submission or an escape or a sweep or, or a combination thereof. And then, and then that will be drilled, and then that will be drilled on several occasions later in the week, and then it will be, we'll come back to it. You know, I, I like to put together functional stories, real world, you know, um, working techniques that lead mm. to something. Um, and then, of course, you know, you, you, you encourage it to be combined in like uh, your free flowing, whether it's, uh, you, know, you know, wrestling or grappling from the feet or, you know, full MMA sparring. You know, uh, and then and then there's ways of obviously um, uh, integrating those techniques that are fresh in the memory of of the student, and sort of having them come out during those those sessions because that's important. You know, you know, it's all very well knowing all these techniques, but can you apply them? Do you see where they're going to be applied? Can you be calm enough to apply them? Do you understand about control? You know, are you going to be able to take your time in a situation that's stressful in order to set something up? Are you going to be able to fake something in order to set something up? You know, um, you know, like uh, jujitsu is a game of chess on the ground, you know, and that's the truth. It's human chess. But MMA is human chess with extra stressors. <laughs> mm. A lot more extra stressors when someone's throwing down and punching on you or, you know, right. putting their weight on with their knee and so yeah, lots of different uh, techniques that I incorporate. But I, what I tend to do is I do look at what other gyms are doing, what other people are doing at the moment. There's ASW in in uh, Manchester, which is just an incredible gym. Uh, there's Rough House. Um, there's Trojan Free Fighters. There's GB Top Team. There's you know there's a there's a wealth of information and gyms who are offering you know their expertise and just putting it out there. Um, so, you know, I, I would be, uh, I would be arrogant to think that I know it all and I, and I'm, you know, I can't learn from others. 
So I, I, I absorb. Very interesting. I, I, I do like uh, the, the analogy of, of the storytelling that, that you speak of because it's, 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 uh, it's, it's fascinating. You know, it, it true, like uh, as a fan of, of these sports, uh, it's, it, you know, a fight is storytelling. And when you approach it in that sequence of different chapters, different situations, what can happen here, and you're talking about transition from one submission to another, it's, it's really cool uh, to, to be taking that, that outlook and always being open to, to the innovation of, of the sport as it moves along. As you mentioned, you're, you're always out there learning and seeing what other teams are, are doing. Now, it's, I want to follow up on, on with this question about Zambia because um, in terms of combat sports, now, of course, you're the president of, of Mixed Martial Arts Zambia and, and you know, you're involved in, in the community uh, and, and, and in, in the country. Tell us, give us an idea of what, what's what a combat what popular combat sports uh be, besides mma are actively practiced in the country and what's the state of combat sports in zambia from from your perspective what are some of the i guess the challenges and and opportunities uh there uh and also for mma sports development what what is this state sorry i'm rambling the question is what's no, the no, state no 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 it's a good question yeah i, I mean um so Traditionally, Zambia has always been, you know, hugely into boxing, and you know, we we did, we we have some fantastic boxers and fantastic female boxers as well. You know, all the way from the days of Lokti Mwali, even to the days of you know Catherine Piri and now uh, Black Diamond. You know, um, we've got we've got good boxing and good boxing stables here in Zambia. Uh, we've got good judo. You know, our judo competitors tend to always make it to the Olympics and always throw up some prizes at the Olympics uh, and occasionally medal, you know. And, um, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, the Judo Association is just a, a such a well-organized association, one of the best associations that, you know, we, we look to some degree to emulate, you know, um, you know. Uh, then you have Kyokushin Karate. So you've got a lot of different karates, a lot of different karates. You've got um, you've got the full contact karates and a lot, they have a lot of uh, members and high level, you know, uh, high level strikers. They tend to uh, not just strictly um, stick to Kyokushin and they tend to mix it up with sort of kickboxing K1 style. Um, but those competitors, you know, they are, so we have a good striking base. I mean, I would say that, you know, techni technical wise, you know, there's room for improvements across the board in terms of striking, you know, uh, more sort of uh, technical aspects. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, at, 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 at the core of these, all these sports that I've said, you know, the technical aspects are there, but, you know, in general, um, I find strikers coming, you know, who keep their chin up and, you know, shoulders down and throw, don't throw the punches as, you know, efficiently as they should or as defensively minded as they should, you know, um, and fighters who tend to move forward rather than uh, know how to throw anything moving backwards, you know. They're, but these are standard issues that, you know, that um, I'm sure all, all gyms and all coaches and instructors come across. Um, how it relates, I mean... What it does is it, it actually provides MMA. We are here in, in such a capacity that we can actually help all these associations because um, the difficulty with all these associations, aside from boxing, um, is that they're all, um, you know, amateur based. You know, there, there's no professional outlet for these athletes. You know, you, you're a fantastic Kyokushin guy, you know, you're world class, but you want to earn a living, you know. Um, or, you know, same with judo, et cetera. So we don't want to, you, know, uh, uh, you know, take athletes away from any of these, uh, these in incredible disciplines. These disciplines actually are part of MMA. They lend themselves. They're, they're part, you know, they're integral to mixed martial arts. What we want is um, competitors from those uh, disciplines to be able to compete in MMA, but give them everything that they need in order to train safely, correctly, and, uh, you know, and, prov and uh, provide their athletes with, you know, the correct training methods, et cetera, so that when it comes to competition, they're not lost. Um, because still to this day, I, I still have people come, 
like no i i know mma you know i i've i'm a, I'm a black belt in a b c and d but you know i've watched a few uh, clips on jujitsu so you know i've got no problems put me in the fight <laughs> i'm like yeah uh, no yeah so you know we we have to we have to get there but i believe that the, the work that has been done by these other associations is only going to be strengthened when for instance the boxing club from you know oydc um uh, has you know uh, an mma team who are also you know bringing publicity to that boxing team you know the same with judo the same with kyokushin the same with dendokan the same with any of these other styles um I think, you know, MMA is here um, to help, and I think it will. Um, but in all in all th- sports development or, you know, it, there's a lot of politics involved, and you, you have to make sure that people trust you and understand your objectives and uh, realize, you know, um, the authority as well that you bring, which we do bring because we've got National Sports Council recognition and IMAF recognition. Um, and 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 how that can actually aid them for their own ends as well. Very interesting. It, it sounds to me like there's there's a lot of uh, potential synergy uh, in in terms of co- collaboration and 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 so on uh, in in Zambia from 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 what you're saying. Uh, in terms of uh, the the Africa Championship that that, that just happened, what are you as a coach? What are your main takeaways? from this year's championship? And what will you and the team be focusing on moving forward? Because I'm sure there were a lot of lessons learned. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, we were, I was hugely encouraged. Uh, you know, I, I, could, I could see that uh, the athletes, you know, that we took the potential that they had to do better than they did and I was proud of what they achieved, you know. Um, you know, it would be foolhardy of me to walk away from the Africa Championships going, you see, we're 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 really good. We're gonna be, we're gonna do just fine. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. Um, no, I mean, there's um there's there's a lot of um adaptions you know, that I've seen that we can take, that we can start to work on in terms of, you know, uh, control. More more to do with control than anything else. You know, distance control, um, control of the hexagon, because we were the EFC Institute, uh, you know, control the fight area, basically. Control on the ground, you know, um, not jumping on submissions when, you know, they're risky, you know, these type of things. Um, just all in order, just just to come back more mature, I think cool. is, is what we'll do. And we we we're going to come back. Uh, hopefully, we'll go to the worlds. And if we go to the worlds, hopefully, we'll take a larger team. And when we take a larger team, we will have more of a fight camp. We only had two and a half weeks um, to prepare for Africa Championships. Uh, we hopefully we will have like a good two months of preparation. And uh, the athletes are also going to get more experience um, because we're about to roll out the, the National Amateur League, uh, which again feeds into what we were, what I was talking about. Because uh, so far in Zambia, there's only been one amateur MMA event, and that's all MMA events in total. One amateur MMA event, one regulated event, and what we want to do is put on regular, you know, monthly events that lead wow. into national selection and that engage the entire country and but we have to take baby steps we can't we can't just jump in there and we want to encourage promoters as well to put on events the problem is uh, as is the case with anywhere uh, promoters want to put on you know events without understanding anything to do with the safety of sport so right. you also sort of talk them through and work them through every, all the aspects and the costs, you know, hey, you can't just do that. You need medicals, you need post-fight medicals, you need ambulance crews, you need the fastest route to the hospital, you need, you know, so, um, but we're getting there, we're getting there. Very interesting. So so there's a possibility of running one event a month, so 12 events uh, a, a year. Wow. Yeah, That's, we're working towards that. Right. First, the first, the first is slated for July, 
And then we're going to do it bi-monthly, so every two months for the first six events. And then after that, we want to do it monthly, uh, accepting any uh, IMAF, you know, uh, big uh, events that we need to plan for. And we also want to hold uh, effectively an open, uh, which would be, you know, like a few hundred competitors over two or three days with more than one cage. But we have to work our way there because the difficulty that you have is not having the right officials or the right, uh, you know, uh, managers, you know, uh, event runners, basically, event management. And the officials, we need our officials to be IMAF certified if we want to, we want to, um, rate, you know, um, officiate a, uh, amateur event that where, the, where, where the results actually matter in the IMAF scheme of things. Um, and for that reason, we've, we've had a couple of referee and judging seminars and workshops, but we still don't have a certified ref. So we're hoping at the next event, we'll bring in uh, MMA South Africa and we'll get our um, ref finally accredited. And that will be a huge step for us. And I think all associations in Africa, that's exactly what they need. They need to have IMF certified refs for their amateur development. And then, you know, they can start to do their events and move towards, um, move towards the bigger picture. Fascinating because the, the scope really is more about developing the entire ecosystem, right? And, and not just the fighter, but everything uh, around it. Now, I have a few more questions. I really appreciate you, your time. I just wanted to know um, what, in terms of COVID, how did COVID impact uh, sports development or, or just activity in, in your country? particularly in, in your sport, uh, MMA? How did COVID impact it? Well, it was completely devastating. I mean, for me, it was incredibly devastating. You know, I was, uh, you know, like I said, I've been running this social project and I had to shut it down. And actually, government mandated that all sports facilities close completely. You know, gyms weren't meant to be open, etc. So we had to close entirely. But worse than that, I had... Uh, I was looking for investors for a performance institute, you know, which is obviously was part and parcel of the growth strategy for the sport, as well as for my, my social project. And, you know, COVID came along and wiped the, the slate clean in terms of investors. Um, we were about to host an event and that event would have had a, you know, a pro main card, international main card and the first amateur card. It's it, basically COVID set us back a good 24 months, you know, um, more. Um, so now it's been devastating, but I think as we move forward, we, we are learning to, uh, to, to live with COVID, you know? Um, and interestingly, you know, the sport is, is helping to encourage athletes to get vaccinated as well, because there's a reluctance to get vaccinated in, uh, you know, in a lot of the communities because there's a lot of disinformation about vaccinations, you know, uh, you know, the, your DNA will change these type of things. But then if you want to go and compete and you want to travel and you want to go to South Africa, you know, and you're vaccinated, um, it's so much easier than having to pay what is, uh, you know, a month's wage for a COVID test every time you travel both ways, you know? Right. So, um, slowly, I think, uh, you know, the, the sport will actually encourage the uptake of vaccinations, et cetera. And uh, the sport will also encourage the correct um, protocols for gyms, you know, uh, hand sanitizer, temperature checks, et cetera. So I think we're, I think we're working, we're getting there. But definitely, it was devastating. It really was. Yeah, I, I can imagine, and obviously, we, we wish you all the best in as as you as you scale back up uh, and and you put on uh, all these uh, the, these events, and you know, what I mean, I I would imagine it takes a, a lot of effort and a lot of work, but uh, you know, you you guys are 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 making the magic happen there as far as uh, MMA sports development. What are your thoughts on IMAF and how they're developing the sport in Africa and and worldwide? But what are your thoughts on IMAF? I think they're doing an incredible job. I really do. I think, you know, um, 
they're learning about the, the continent as well as they go and they're adapting and um uh with those adaptions they're they're providing more support you know um you know it's very difficult here um you know in africa in general to get the support or funding you need from government for example to 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 get moving until you've got uh, basically the process has had to adapt slightly but what they offer in terms of um you know uh uh resources and 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 support is, is second to none as i said as i said earlier it really is development of the sport i mean on the african continent the, the fact that i can now reach out to angola the president of angola you know arrange a uh competition in angola go down with my fighters and likewise they can come here and uh, same with zimbabwe and namibia and you know as we grow the IMAF family, it's only going to open the doors uh, for more opportunities for athletes, you know. Um, the issue of uh, funding, though, is an, an endemic issue with, in Africa. It's not the same as in other... I mean, I know that um, even our European partners, they struggle if they have to go and they have to cover flights and they have to accommod cover accommodation. But it's a different kettle of fish here, you know. Um, so working towards that type of support where um, you travel to a international meet and those type of uh, costs are covered, that's gonna, that's gonna, that's that's the way forward. And I think we we're, we're all on on the road to to the, to those goals. Um, but no, I mean, uh, I've got nothing but uh, complimentary words for IMAF and how they've aided. Um, us and the other uh, associations in the region it's been second to none support so um, yeah hands down any 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 country in Africa should be reaching out to IMA my last question I think you, you've somewhat answered it right there what advice do you have for other African countries and coaches in terms of furthering uh, the development of amateur mixed martial arts right okay so twofold um, First of all, to anyone who's considering setting up a federation, uh, get your house in order. You don't, you know, first of all, you are going to have to do a monumental amount of work. So embrace it. You are going to uh, need a, a team behind you. Uh, and you, not necessarily, they're not necessarily going to pull their weight until you have set the foundations. What you need is a very strong constitution, which is transparent, democratic, lays the foundations and protects the vision. This is extremely important. Once you have that, you need to work towards registration with your national sports council or your ministry of sport. It's extremely important. At the same time, you can then engage IMAF uh, as, and they will help you towards those ends and those goals. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's, it is about a strong constitution and understanding uh, the, the, the principles involved, you know, um, the career progression pathways, the certification programs, how you're going to in order for your athletes, you know, and, um, and yeah, um, that transparency, et cetera. For coaches on the continent, I'll just say, never think you know everything. Keep keep looking, keep learning, keep adapting. Um, you know, uh, you you will be able to um, achieve what you want to achieve. You know, uh, you just got to you just got to work hard at it. And um, yeah, um, you 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 need to support. Uh, whichever group comes together as a governing body, because uh, there's there tends to always be a lot of infighting and a lot of um, you know uh, suspicion. Um, but you need that um, that structure. You need to work within that structure. So you support the association that is looking to affiliate with IMAF and the, the National Sports Council. They will be guided by IMAF, even if you don't necessarily. Um, you know, if, even if you're suspicious of some of the people at the top, <clears throat> trust me, they have to conform 
to to what uh, good governance is, or else they will not be a part of IMF. So, you know, um, work to support them. That's some uh, excellent advice. Uh, I just want to thank you again for, for, for this great interview. I'd like to know where can we follow you online? And if people want to reach out, how, how can they reach out to you? Uh, thank you very much again. I, I appreciate your time and your effort here. And I think your channel is <clears throat> really interesting and I'm looking forward to like, uh, you know, cross promoting and working with you because I think what you're doing is fantastic. Thank you. Um, so you can find my my team is called Lemu Fight Academy, which means respect. So Lemu Fight Academy, U L E M U. Uh, that's on Facebook. Uh, I've lost my 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 Instagram handle, but yeah, I'll get that going again. Um, you can also follow the association, which is uh, very you know very informative, and you know we do a lot of good social media stuff. That is MMA Zambia. MMA Zambia, you can't miss it. It's got the IMAF style logo with uh, our national flag. Um, and then myself, you can find me. I've got a public profile on Facebook as well. That's Benjamin Z Bush. You can find me on uh, Facebook there. And I'm on Instagram with my personal Instagram, which is Ben underscore Impanga. Impanga means bush in Nyanja as well. So uh, you can find me there. And right on, thanks man. again. Thank you very much, and, and keep up the great work. We'll be following, and uh, we hope to interview you again, of course. Thanks again. Have a blessed day. Thank you, you so too. much. Take care, brother.